afternoon, everyone. Any questions? Yes. Number eight and ten on the quiz. That just was. Uh, that's over. Yeah. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> let's have a quick look at this one here. So we have these, these matchsticks here. And so we have this figure here. Um, and we want to know how many matchsticks are needed for, let's say, th uh, just three of these boxes, right? Three of these squares. And so what recursion tells us is we're supposed to look at the simpler problem. That would be this problem here. And then we add three matchsticks, right? So it would be a return of this, this one here, three plus matchsticks squared minus one. Is that not the correct answer? Let's see what, OK. Oh, I don't, can I see from here? I, I don't know how to check it from here. So, so um, who, who asked the question? Did I address the question? Did, did you see what I did? Yeah. So, so the idea in general is that recursion is, uh, means you, know, you try to be as lazy as you possibly can. And you say, I'm just going to assume that the answer is already known for smaller instances. So if I know how big this thing here is, then I get the next bigger one by adding three matchsticks. And so this one is the one that's one size smaller. This actually, I think, is a pretty good problem because it's, I mean, you don't really know how many matchsticks there are, but it, it shows really how the recursion works. So that was eight. And then we have 10. All right, um, so we're trying to find the sum so let me draw a, uh, draw a picture of some array with some numbers and so I'm giving an index so to the last one so let's say I'm getting this index here and then I'm supposed to sum up these values here and so when you have a sum like this, how can you be lazy? The eager way of doing it is, of course, to like, compute the sum of the four values. But we want to do it the lazy way. So the lazy way would be to know that either I know what this sum is and add the four to it, or I know what the other sum is, what, what the sum of these is, and I add the one in the front. And now we have to pick what, what the options are that we get. Um, well, actually, I know it has to be first compute this sum and then add the last one because we're getting the index of the last one. And so now let's do some, some multiple choice talent here. Um, the first two can't possibly be right. Why not? Well, yeah. Oh, I'm not even going to look at them because they are not looking at the, that ARR of anything. Notice that they're not ha looking at all at anything in the array. 
right? It's some expression that calls itself, but it doesn't look at the array. Well, that means that the recursiveness will also not look at the array, and the next recursion will also not look at the array. Well, if all of those calls can't look, don't look at the array, they can't possibly compute it. So they must be wrong because they're not even looking at the array. The last two do look at the array. And now, how do they try to simplify the problem? So here's the simpler problem. Well, this one now goes, goes further to the right. So right now, I was asked to compute them up to here. And the third one now says, now go all the way up to here. That does not look like a simplification to me. Right? Simpler means to do less work. But if you sum more numbers, that's more work. So that can't work. So the right answer would have to be D simply by elimination. Was it D? All right. Does that, other questions? And it's perfectly uh, a good idea uh, to ask a question about a quiz if you were confused. Chances are everyone else or some, some other people were confused as well. So I'm perfectly happy to, to go through a little bit of that. All right, so I have a couple of things for the homework. So it's again going to be in, uh, a more involved homework that has some algorithmic challenges. And there are two things that I wanted to talk about that I spotted when looking at your solutions for the draft. So here I have one solution where someone was trying to do something um, with, what, okay, uh, what do you think this 96 and 97 and 65 So yeah, so those are the the ASCII of also the Unicode code points for sixty five happens to be the uppercase A, ninety seven is a lowercase A. And so what's bad about it? So I hope that I taught you this in 46A. There's a section in the, uh, in a, a, like a tip in the textbook says, don't ever use magic numbers. What's a magic number? Like 65 is a magic number. A magic number is a number where you look at the code and you say, what the heck is 65? Is it 2 to the 6 plus 1 or, you know, one better than 64 bits. Uh, so a magic number is any number that sits in the code without explanation. So that's, all, that's something that you should not do. Um, if this number has some real reasonable explanation, you could use a constant. So you would say final inch and then you give it a name. That's fine. But in the case of 65, you could of course simply write quote uppercase A quote and that's a character constant. And that's now no longer magic. It means the character constant A. And that's perfectly legitimate. Um, but that still actually is not so good. Um, what's a better way of checking whether a character is a letter? How do you check if a character is a digit? Is digit. How do you check if it's a letter? What's that? Is letter. There's a method in the character class called character is letter. And so that seems to be like a better way of checking whether something is a letter. So you should be familiar with these classifier functions, is letter, is digit, is white space. 
um, and you should always use those. Um, in this particular example, it doesn't much matter, but in general, is letter has a huge advantage over checking whether it's between A and Z. Namely that 99% of letters in, la in human languages are not between A and Z. Right? All the Chinese characters that are letters, of which there are tens of thousands, they're letters, but they're not between A and Z. Doesn't much matter here for our multiple choice quiz, but in general, you will want to recognize them as letters. Even accented letters, like the E with the accent, it's a letter, but it's not between A and Z. So these days, um, you, you don't want to say letters or just you know, the upper and lowercase letters from A to Z. That made sense, you know, I don't know know when it made sense, but these days, just about any computer application that you want to write, you want it to be usable all around the world, so you want to be somewhat sensitive to that. All right, so that was one of the things, a pretty simple concept to, to use is letter, is digit, and so on. Also with is digit, by the way, not everyone uses the our digits from zero to nine, right? There are many cultures where they use different symbols for the digits, and is digit will find them all. The other thing has to do with helper functions. So look at this code here. So here this uh, person, or sadly these two people, um, said ArrayList boy name one is new ArrayList. ArrayList boy name two is new ArrayList. While in one has next. String R is in, in one dot next line. And so on and so on. And then you see over here, you see the exact same code. You see, there's the exact same lines of code replicated. So, if you find yourself doing that, and I would imagine that this person did not actually type it twice, right? I would imagine that this person said, oh, I have to do the same thing again, copied and pasted it, and then fixed up all the ones to twos. And so if you find yourself doing that, what should you do instead? You should definitely say, well, wait a minute, this is unprofessional, and you should write a helper function. And that has two advantages. One is, if there's an error in one place, you don't always have to fix it in two places. But the other one that's more important is, when you write that helper function, you tend to have to stop for a second and say, what exactly is this function supposed to do? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? And that extra thought, whenever I have to do this, I find it really generally helps me organize the flow of the program better. I usually start out writing the function that does just exactly the code that's in here. But more often than not, I say, oh, I could actually make this a little bit more general or a little bit more useful or a little bit clearer. And then this gives me an opportunity to improve the code right then and there. So I'm very bullish on identifying this opportunity to factor out common code because it's usually also an opportunity to come up with something that uh, that's going to make your life uh, easier later. So interestingly enough, the fellow on the other side wrote the helper function. You can see it down here, and then left it blank. So I don't know whether this was whether uh, he or she just ran out of time. Um, but so those helper functions are a big win, and for particularly for homework. What which one is this for? The one with the one with the baby names. Right? Well, you obviously have to do the same thing multiple times. In the final, particularly, you have to read the boys and the girls, and then you have to subtract the, 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 the boys from the girls one way and the other way. And so you should be able to do that without duplicating the same code over and over. Make yourself a bunch of helper functions. So you know, it's a little funny in Java that these helper functions that they read private static, but that's just the way it is. So anytime you just need a helper function, that doesn't need any global state. You just make it a private static thing. And uh, that way you can call it from main. And that's fine. All right, so those are the two things that I wanted to point out as tips from what I've observed from Moss. So let's get going with recursion. So like I said, the basic idea of recursion is to, to try to be as lazy as possible and to compute things by looking at simpler cases. So here I have these triangle numbers, and they're, of course, just a toy example. So you have these triangles. I'm making myself a class triangle um, to compute their width, uh, or their area, I should say. And so I start out simple. If the triangle is just this thing here with one square, then it clearly has area one. No big deal there. I move on and say, 
Now if I have a bigger triangle, I really don't want to figure out how many squares it has. But instead I'm going to say, let's assume that someone else knows how big this one is. And then I just add 4, right? So the smaller one, whatever that is, plus 4, that's the one that I want. And why plus 4? Because that's the width. And now the catch is, how do I get the area of the smaller one? And so with this triangle class, it's particularly nice because it's a class. So if I want to have a triangle of 4, then I say, give me a new triangle of 4. For this one here, I say, give me a new triangle of 3. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm making the smaller triangle. I'm just going to construct it. And it's there. It's come to life. And so I can ask it, how big are you? What's your area? And then the smaller triangle is going to tell me, oh, I'm 6. I'm 6 whatever square meters. And then I say, well, in that case, me, the slightly bigger one, am 10. And that's how recursion works. That's all there is to it. It's the simplest idea in the world. And that's really, in, in, in general, all that you need to know about it. So here's the complete method. And all of these recursive methods have the same J basic structure. You have this thing here, which is called the base case. The base case handles the absolutely simplest cases. You need a base case because otherwise, if the triangle of size uh, of width 4 would ask the triangle of width 3, which asks the triangle of width 2, which asks the triangle of width 1, which asks the triangle of width 0, which asks the triangle of width minus 1, it wouldn't work, right? You would have what's called an infinite recursion. So it has to stop somewhere. And so one typically stops at 0 or 1 or some such uh, small case. And then you have the, the general case where you reduce the harder problem to uh, you first solve the simpler problem. Or in fact, you don't solve it. You just assume that it can be solved. And then you take the solution of the simpler problem and turn them into the solution of the harder problem. So <coughs> here, this slide here, goes through how, how the call pattern works. And I'm going to tell you a deep secret of recursive programming. Don't look at this slide. You don't want to know how it works. Nothing can come up. Nothing good can come out of it. So the fact that one function calls another, that calls another, that calls another, that calls another, that calls another, it's, it doesn't help you when programming with recursion. You should simply assume that when the triangle of size 4 asks the triangle of size 3, what's your area? And then that smaller one says, I'm s my area is 6. That's all you need to know. You only need to think about one level down. There's no sense in trying to f get all excited about the fact that that other triangle makes new triangles and so on. So always think just one level. And so in the book, there is the. Um, I think it's in this edition of the book where there's, there's a chapter opener photo for every chapter. And in this one, it's the person with the vacuum cleaner. Because when you think about cleaning, vacuuming an entire house, that's a big job. But my feeling is if someone else can vacuum all the other rooms and I just vacuum this room, then I vacuum the whole house, right? And that's how recursion works. You say someone else does all the simpler work of size, of a smaller size, and then I just do the one extra thing that needs to be done. So that's really all you need to know um, to, to be successful with recursion. Um, and <coughs> we'll be do, doing lots of practice. A couple of things is um, this triangle number thing is, of course, it's an intuitive example, right? Because it's easy enough to see you have the small triangle that's sitting inside the slightly bigger triangle. And so it's visually intuitive. But in this case, you didn't actually need recursion to compute this area. So you, it's, uh, the area is, of course, you know, the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to the width, right? You have 1, 2, 3, 
and so on here. And so you could just compute that sum with a simple loop. I mean, you all know how to do that. So here, you know, you have a simple loop that does that. Or in fact, you don't even need a loop. If you remember a little bit of math, you will know that the sum of the numbers from one to n is n times n plus one over two. And you could just compute that. Um, so I'm not saying recursion is useful for this particular example. We will see other examples soon enough where recursion would be very difficult to, to avoid. But right now, we're just practicing the technique of it with cases where a loop would work just as well. So next Monday, you're going to be seeing some more, uh, much more interesting computations where the recursion, it's still not necessary. You can always change recursion into loops. But those loops would get very, very ugly. So today, we're just doing the simple stuff to get the mechanics right. All right. So we have a clicker question here. We have, we have a mystery shape, which is not a triangle, but some other shape. You know, we don't really know what it is. You know, some blob. And so to compute the area of a mystery shape, we say, well, we somehow make two smaller ones. And then we combine the answers that we get from those. So what I want you to do is to, to run this in your head, or more likely on a sheet of paper, and tell me what is the area of a mystery shape of size 4. Let me get uh, Piazza going. Oh, come on. That is stupid of you. Okay, I'll just make another one. Okay, vote away.
All right, let's just get going while the stragglers are working on this. So we're asking for mystery shape four. So I want to know what is mystery shape four. So I'm making a mystery shape of four over two, that's two. So that's a mystery shape of two. You are the mystery shape two. Okay, he is now. I'm just waiting for him to tell me how big it is. Okay, what are you gonna do? Never gonna sit in the front row again. Um, <laughs> okay, so which, which mystery shape are you gonna construct? Which one? Which size? You are mystery shape too, remember? So you're going to make a what? Which size? You are two. A one, yes. You are a mystery shape of one. Okay. How big are you? Okay, you've heard what she says. She's one. Okay, how big are you? So you've heard that she's one. So that's here. Okay. So now what you're going to have to do is, you've heard the one, so you're going to say, okay, it looks like I'm four, right? Except if you were odd. Were you odd? No, you were not odd, right? All right, so you were not odd, you were even, and so this doesn't even apply to you. So what are you going to tell me? Which is what? Yes, so I'm hearing that that one is 4, so now I'm going to compute 4 times 4, and that's 16. Okay, that's how recursion works. And so it's a really good idea to, to visualize that the recursive computation is someone else, which is why I did this. Because that way, you won't get it confused in your own mind. Of course, in your own mind, the someone else is a little bit difficult. What I often do when I need to trace the recursive computation, I, I get a couple of index cards, and on each of the separate cards, I write a separate invocation. That way, it's easy to keep track of at what level you are. Because otherwise, you only have one brain, and, and it gets a little more tedious. But so, so the index card technique also works if you don't have a bunch of people hanging around. So, you know, you could have, say, the four, then calls the two, then calls the one, the one returns one, and then you have to go back and say here, four times one, and then over here it's four times four. Um, so anyway, the answer is 16. Let's see what our recursive powers are here. And so a good number, about two-thirds got this right. And so, of course, we need to be at the level where like 100% get this right. This is the very basics of recursion. So if you have trouble with this, by all means, you know, work at this un until that confusion goes away. All right, here we have another interesting question. So this is a mystery function that returns something. I, I recommend that you try out what is, for example, mystery of 10. Try it out in your, uh, in your own head or on a piece of paper. And then tell me from your observation which of these choices is likely to be correct. Let me make another poll.
So what's the mystery of ten call? Help me out here. What's the mystery of ten call? Five, right? Cause mystery of five. What is mystery of five call? Sixteen, right? And then it goes to eight, four, two, one. And now we go back up to four? No, because then we're returning one, right? So what is mystery of 10? It's one, right? All right. Now, armed with this information, I would like to have a few more votes here. So almost everyone said it always returns one. There's a there's nine users who said it never returns any value, but those nine users should really reconsider because that can't possibly be right. Because look, if n is one, then it returns one. So sometimes it returns a value. There are 18 users who said it can return any integer value, but how? This thing calls itself and calls itself and calls itself and calls itself. At some point, it has to actually return a number, and the only number that it ever returns is one. There's no other return statement. Yes? Well, um, so we can do it in slow motion. So if I call mystery of, what did I start, 10, right? Mystery of 10 does not actually know how to go back or anything. Mystery of 10 only knows how to call mystery of 5. Mystery of 5 returns 1. And... So that's what it returns. Now you might say, well, but what about mystery of five? And remember Horstman's rule is you don't think about it. Mystery of five somehow works. You know, on another day you might say, you know, I'll buy you a beer if you talk about mystery of five. And let's say you did, then I would say, well, let's look at mystery of five. What does mystery of five do? It calls mystery of 16. And what does mystery of 16 do? It returns a one. And that's what mystery of five returns. It would cost you two beers to find out what mystery of 16 does. And I will tell you it calls mystery of eight, which returns a one. Okay, so so the only thing that gets returned here is 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 one. And so it's important to realize that you know mystery calls itself, and just think of one level deep, and then uh, you can figure it out. Now, so the interesting thing is this one here. The only time that it returns an actual number, it's one, and so that's the only thing that can come out at the end. Whereas with the previous one, with the uh, with this, this one here, we called, so I could have written this one here by saying if width equals one, return one,
and I could ma just made a, f a static function instead of making a class and I, then I could say otherwise return area of width minus one plus one so I could have written something like that but see in this case sure in the base case it returns one but in the next case it already returns something that can assume some other value than one no it wouldn't be a plus one right but be plus width so this is the situation where one of the returns returns one and the other return returns something different than one so we can't say it always returns one but this particular function here the mystery function was just weird it returns one all the time so could it be possible for this function never to return And it might be, right? Because it could happen that you keep going into this case here with a 3n plus 1. And so it's conceivable that it gets bigger and bigger. Well, it's not so easy, right? Because when you start with, say, 11, that would be an odd number. 3n plus 1 is 34. And so it, because it's a plus 1, it has to be an even number. So then it's 17, right, divided by 2. 3n plus 1 is 52. So now, now this is math. 26, 13, 40. Oh, now it goes 20, 10, and then we know how that goes to 0 eventually. So that one, but that one is going to eventually come back. But maybe there are some numbers where this 3n plus 1 keeps on going and it gets larger and larger. Now, oddly enough, nobody knows. You could win, a, I believe, a million dollars if you found a proof that this never happened. No one out there uh, knows today whether there are some numbers that for which this recursion might not convert, which is kind of weird. So it's conjectured that this always returns, but no one knows for sure. So here's an, an, an interesting example. You have, when you started with 27, it goes through all of these calls before it goes to 1. Yes? What's that? If it what? Oh, yes, thank you, sure. Oh, is that why you said it never returns any value? Oh, very good, yes, 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 that's a typo. I have to fix that in the slides. Yes? What about zero? Let's see what happens for zero. So if n is zero, ooh, very good. So that would be another reason to check on two. So what he says is, so I didn't think of zero. Um, so if, if, if you check f of zero, then that calls, I'm, I'm calling mystery f for simpler writing, that calls zero again. And so for that, it would not return, right? Excellent. It would never return. Well, but um, see, b because it's ah, it's an even number. Zero is an even number, so it'll call. It goes into this branch and returns zero over two. Well, it doesn't return zero over two. It calls, returns mystery of zero over two. So it calls itself again, and it calls itself again. So it would be an infinite recursion. Very good. So then actually the correct answer is two because we have found one case in which it fails to return. Excellent, for, for minus one, I'm sure I planned this like this when I wrote the slides. Um, for minus one, um, that wouldn't happen, right? For minus one, um, it, it would fall through. Minus two is another interesting question. So I should really rearrange this slide to deal better with zero and negative numbers. All right, now you get to do this. And so what I would now want you to compute in this uh, little code check program. Um, oh, I see. I'll fix that.
All right, so if you refresh now, it works. Um, <coughs> so now I want you to compute the number of steps that this process takes. So to go from 27 to 1 takes, oh, I don't know how many steps, but it's a lot, right? Um, to go from 10 to 1, what was it, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 1. And it took one, one, two, three, four, five steps. And so I'm asking you to, to compute that. And of course, you want to compute it recursively. So if one asks the 10, how many steps does it take you, Mr. or Mrs. 10, to reduce yourself to one? then the 10 should not go off and do this computation in a while loop. The 10 should ask the 5 and say, hey, you 5, how long did it take you? And out of that information, then come up with what the 10 uses. So that's what you see here. So if you have an even number, How many steps does it take? If you have an odd number, how many steps does it take? We're not going to deal with zeros and negatives here. Um, and if it's z zero, no, sorry, if it's one, that's really what we care about, how many steps does it take? And actually, I think I have a typo in here. Let me try this. Um, now, go ahead and run it, and I'll find out if I have a typo. I think this might have to be a long, because those numbers can be pretty big. So humor me and change this. And change this int to a long. And I'll make the clicker question. I only have seven votes. Okay, I'm going to step out for a minute to get some more votes.
All right, so let's, since people seem to have trouble with this. So, how do you compute steps of 10? So that's the steps that it that takes the 10 to go down. So remember the rule, you have an, an even number, it gets cut in half. You have an odd number, it gets multiplied by 3 plus 1. And so on. So we want to know how many steps does it take the 10. So who's the 10 going to ask? So the, the 10 needs to ask some other step, the step of some other number and compute out of that information, you know, by doing some kind of arithmetic, the answer. Who's step 10 going to ask? Five, yes. So it's going to ask step five. And then we add plus one, right? Because it's going to take it one more step Kind of the 5, I have no idea how many steps the, the 5 is going to take, but the 10 is going to take one more step. So that's, that's all there is to it. So in general, here it's steps of n over 2 plus 1. How about for an odd number? So who's the 5 going to ask? So we have an odd number. No. So steps five is uh, should be computed. So n is five. So who's steps five going to ask? It's going to ask step sixteen and say, "Hey, how long did it take you?" And then it's going to add one more, right? Because it went one to five to sixteen to eight, four, and so on. So it's the length of this chain plus 1. So in general, it is <coughs> 3 times n plus 1. And then plus 1 because we're one more than that. So this is the case where we only have 1 left. So this is where the computation of steps 1. That's the simplest case. So what do we return? Yeah, zero or maybe one. It's a little vague, right? Is, 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 is this a step? Is it not? So, because when you have something like 16 to 8 to 4 to 2 to 1, it depends. Are you counting the arrows or are you counting the numbers? And the problem statement wasn't totally clear on it. Right now, I'm just going to count the numbers and so I say one is still one number so I count that as a step. So let's see what happens. And now I get 950 but that I believe is because I messed up here. Oh that wasn't very nice of you. Um, so Chrome loses the work every time? Oh, great. I, I normally use Firefox, which doesn't. I have to do something about that. 
plus one. No, we still get 950. All right. So, was, oh, I see. So here, here there was a choice 949. So I think that's uh, where the zero comes in. Um, so I should have made that another choice. So let me try this if, if I have a zero here. Well, I'm not going to do it right now. All right. So now I would imagine these these thirty four users who said something else that you know most likely there was this confusion about nine fifty versus nine forty nine that was my bad so I'm hoping that a good number of people can do this all right so <clears throat> I'm going to go through this exercise here a, a little bit on uh, this example on how you think recursively. So the problem right now, it's again, it's a silly, simple problem, but it's good to explain the thinking process. It's you have a string, and you want to find out what's a palindrome. What's a palindrome? This is something that you often, you must have seen palindromes before. It's a sentence that you can read backwards and forwards if you strip out the punctuation marks. So you know, here's a classic. American pa uh, palindrome, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. You read it backwards and it says, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, right? And we all know the very first palindrome ever spoken is, of course, Madam, I'm Adam. All right, so we want to find, we want to test whether a particular sentence is a palindrome or not, and we want to use recursion. And so when you think recursively, you want to take a complicated problem and turn it into a simpler problem. So here's my string. And now I want to somehow decide whether a simpler string is a palindrome. So for example, would it be useful Would it be useful to cut off the first character? And so what I mean with useful, I mean, is the problem of deciding whether this string here is a palindrome, does it have anything to do with whether the bigger string is a palindrome? And obviously it doesn't, right? Because it's, it, it's just not a useful simplification. Similarly, cutting it through in the middle doesn't seem very useful because if I, what would it tell me if I knew that the, the two other strings, they aren't palindromes. But the key simplification here is if you take your palindrome and you cut off both ends, in that case, you can recursively decide is the middle thing a palindrome? And if it wasn't, then you would know the answer, then the longer thing can't be a palindrome either. But if the middle thing is a palindrome, then you've made some good progress. Then you now only have to compare the first and the last character. And if they are the same, then the whole thing is a palindrome. And so the thinking recursively thing here is that in this particular problem, the simpler problem means cut both ends. In the case of the triangle numbers, the simpler problem was cut off the bottom. And so it depends on the problem on how you want to simplify it. Oh. Yeah. So <coughs> this is what I just said. Um, and so then one comes to the situation. Now we kind of know what our strategy is. So I could now write this up in pseudocode, right? So it says, take <coughs> first and last character. Take everything but. Uh, 
And now what do we return? We return that the first and last character are the same and So that's my pseudocode. Return first equals last and is palindrome of everything but. So I'm returning a Boolean condition that is true if both of these are true. And you know, it's perfectly good pseudocode um, to take everything but. How do you do that? It's some substring thing, right? Substring from one to whatever, length minus one, length minus two. Um, that, that's an implementation detail. But so the key is that this way you compute the is palindrome method on smaller and smaller palindromes. Now, the final thing is we have to figure out when to stop. And so that stopping thing is, uh, is always a little bit hairy. You just saw that where I didn't know whether to stop at one or at zero. And we're gonna run into the same problem here. So if we, let me call my function is p right now because I don't want to write everything. So is A a palindrome? Yeah, yeah. yeah, right? Same forward and backwards. What about the empty string? I would think so, right? It seems to look the same way from here and from here. So it's a palindrome, right? So, um, so we return true in both cases. And notice that I can't omit either one of the cases because I can't cut the A in half, right? So when I keep chopping off things at the end, if the original string had an even number of characters, I eventually end up with the empty string. If the original string had an odd number of characters, then I end up with a single string. So I need both of these termination points. So sometimes you have two termination points depending on how, how your simplification goes. So with two characters, I don't need a special rule because I have a string with two characters like A, B. I can still chop it in half. I'm left over with the empty string. And so this one would not be a palindrome because the A and B don't match, but if it was A, A, then it would be a palindrome. So that's, that's the recursive thinking example. And then you see the source code here. And there's nothing much to the source code. It looks like really tedious, right? The source code deals with one other interesting case actually. And so it looks at the case where um, one of the characters is not a letter. So it says if you have, remember madam, I'm Adam. It deals with a case where you have an exclamation mark here. And in that case it says, hey, my simplest string is just the one with the exclamation mark removed. And I'm again gonna call myself on, on that and let the recursion do its thing. So when you read that code in the book, you'll find that extra uh, wrinkle on it. All right, so we have another clicker question too. Um, I guess this is not actually two, right? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip it though because I wanna talk about helper methods. All right, so we'll skip that question. Um, so when you design a recursion, uh, what you've seen so far was a simple case where the triangle made another triangle. The, uh, <coughs> that mystery method called the mystery method again. And, but oftentimes you're in a situation where you wanna do something and by itself it's hard to do recursive, but you can make a helper method where it's really easy. And uh, so in the example that we had with the palindromes here, um, I made new sentence objects all the time. Here I made a shorter sentence. And I kind of like to make these new objects because it's very, it's intuitive to me that one object asks the other object which asks the third object. Just like you know, we were asking each other uh, uh, some question, but it's not very efficient. So it's more efficient actually 
to have a method. And so here I'm doing this with a helper method. Here it is. And that helper method has these extra parameters for the start and the end. So I'm asking, is the segment between start and end, is that segment a palindrome? And that's a completely artificial question. Not something you would normally want to know, but it turns out that if I use this helper method, then I can always keep operating on the same sentence, and I just move the segment and make the beginning and the end of the segment closer and closer. So, <coughs> in the next assign homework assignments where you have to d do some recursive programming, you'll often be in a situation where instead of programming a recursive method, you'll want to do this helper method instead. And so here I'm giving you an example of that. So I'm having a mystery helper method that has these two kind of random looking parameters. It gets an array and wants to do something with this array. Gets these random parameters and then gets some answer. And I want you to tell me what does it actually compute? So ponder that for a minute and I'll set up the Piazza thing. And this is quick click a question four then. Start was zero. All right, so I'm going to be using my index card method here. So I'm starting out with some values, you know, whatever they were. They're always the same, 3, 1, 4. Go away, go away. Then the start here was 0. And integer min value, I'll write minus infinity. That's essentially the same thing. And so now I'm supposed to return mystery of values start plus one. And what the heck goes in here? What is val start was what? Start is zero. So values of start is three. What is the max of minus infinity and three? Three, right? Three is larger than minus infinity. So now that thing makes another call. I'll put over here to values two and because you know, this increases here. And now the max of one and three, which is three, that thing makes another call to values with three and. The max of 3 and 4, which is 4. OK, and now, you, now I leave it to you to unravel this. Let's see how many people did this. 63 people did this so far.
So in this last call, we're now running into this line here. So what is the last call return? It returns whatever got passed in here. So that over here, it returns four. Where does it return it to? It returns it to this guy. And notice that this guy returns it without further change. It just returns what it got. So the four gets kicked out of here as well. So with that, do we have an answer? 98 people do. And so most of them did in fact say the correct answer, the four. All right, so this is something that for, for some people it is super easy and some people find it really confusing. And at this point, you know in which of the two camps you fall and you're going to have to adjust your life accordingly. All right, I'll see you Monday.